topic of my talk this afternoon has been inspired by a Monty Python movie, which some of you might already know. It's called The Life of Brian. In this movie, Brian tries to convince a lot of people gathered in a crowd to think for themselves, and he tells them, you're all different. They yell back in a single chorus, yes, we're all different, except for one rogue individual at the back who yells out, I'm not. Now, that guy was onto something. Difference is very important, and I would like to pick up from where Brian and the rogue individual <coughs> left off and discuss why variation and difference is so important in human life. I can see in the audience today a huge variety in physical attributes. I can see different ages. And I can also see that we probably have different habits, behaviors, as well as genetics, of course. I can also see that retail has responded to this very well, because you're all wearing fantastic outfits. And which retail has ensured are available to fit your choices? When retail does not respond to our differences, we punish them heavily. We don't buy their stuff, and we all get on social media or whatever platforms and complain very vociferously. Today, I'd like to talk about one area of our lives where when the service provider fails to recognize difference and respond to that, we are the ones that suffer. And that is healthcare. We already know that there are several health inequalities and that they have many causes. These include ethnicity and socioeconomic factors. But there's one driver of health inequalities that I'd like to focus on today. And that is one that arises as a result of systematic disregard of variation within our health system. COVID-19 has already shown us that there's no such thing as a standard human. We're all different, and those differences, if ignored, can lead to health inequalities. And that health inequality can mean the difference between life and death. This is because variation in people translates to differences in risk factors, differences in symptoms, and our response to treatment. When we disregard this, it can have profound impact within our public health responses. So let's have a look at COVID. Early on in the pandemic, we knew very well that elderly people were more at risk of disease and that the converse was true for children. And yet, we put a string of responses within our public health mitigation strategies that disregarded this variation. And the result of that, we all know. The biggest travesty we had was a blanket lockdown response. As it turns out, as you can see from many different reports and the conversations that were going on at the time, this response did not do enough to protect the elderly. They needed more protection. The result of that was that thousands of the elderly died in the United Kingdom and millions globally. The converse is true for children. That response was too drastic and too extreme for children. And we all know the devastating effects that has had on mental health and their education, consequences of which we'll be living with for years to come. That one size fit all response was catastrophic for both groups. Let me give you another example. Condoms. Condoms are a very important intervention strategy for sexually transmitted diseases and HIV. In 2017, African ministers of health lined up to complain that the condoms available as standard size were too small for the populations in their countries. <laughs> the Americans, the Europeans, and the South Asians joined in with a litany of complaints. The condoms were too small, they were too big, they were too wide, they were too long, they were too short. The long and short of it, as it were, was that there was no standard size condom. Now, really? We have known for centuries that there's variation in the size of yeast attributes. <laughs> and yet, when it came to an important public health intervention, we didn't take this into account. We decided to go with a one-size-fits-all. Thankfully, 
retail has rescued us from this, and we can now find condoms for different sizes. Now, this notion of variation and difference in public health is not a new concept. Those of us who work in population health know that when faced with a new disease, you must absolutely ask one of uh, a series of three questions, starting with who's affected, why are they affected, and what do we do now that we have that information? You might think this is relevant only for public health emergencies like COVID and um, HIV, but actually it's not. It is absolutely critical for our day-to-day -day care. It is vital for you and me that our health system takes this into account. I'm going to give you three examples of what happens when each of these stages is ignored. Let's start with the who. The who is where we end up when we have our diagnostics. So our diagnostics tell us who is affected. I have been working on a group of autoimmune diseases, lupus and sclerosis, that disproportionately affect people of African origin. Now these diseases, you get better outcome of treatment if you catch them early. Globally, it is well accepted that these diseases are really worse in people who are of African descent. So when they are treated, the outcome is poor. And I was interested in finding out why, so I set up a collaboration with colleagues in Zimbabwe and we had a look at these diseases. What we found was quite profound. The diagnostic criteria, which are the international guidelines for how you say somebody has lupus or sclerosis before you treat them, are set using data from Caucasian patients. When we looked at this criterion, they overlooked a significant amount of molecular and clinical signs that occur early in people of black African descent. Unsurprisingly, these people are caught later in the disease progression and their treatment outcome is less successful. Let's move on to the why. We all know that one of the most important sources of risk factors is genetics. When we look at the current genetic database where we can identify these risk factors, we find that a disproportionately large amount of that data comes from people of European origin, 78%. And a woeful 2% comes from the African population. Now the irony of this, of course, is that the African continent harbors more human genetic variation than the rest of the world put together. So what this means is that we are currently missing a significant amount of genetic risk factors in African populations. Let's move on to the what and look at interventions. Some of you may remember this conversation in this country around November last year. The health secretary indicated that oximeters, so devices that we use to measure medical oxygen in your blood, were not performing well in people of color and in women. Oximeters are critical, not just for COVID-19, but for pneumonias and a range of other medical conditions, such as um, complicated childbirth. And the other thing is, we have known for decades that there's a range of oximeters out there that underestimate when we should induce medical oxygen therapy in our patients. What amazes me is that we have not acted on that in informing our procurement procedures in this country, or as it turned out in the US. The health secretary in this country indicated in November last year that that lack of insight may have resulted in a lot of lives being lost as a result of COVID-19. Let's talk about treatment. I am going to introduce you to a disease. This disease is called schistosomiasis, or the common name is Bilharzia. It is prevalent in a lot of tropical countries where the parasites live in freshwater rivers. Some of you here might have heard about that disease when Prince William contracted it in 2003 on holiday in Kenya. Others might have heard about it because in Scotland we get about 100 cases in travelers every year. Now in the case of those travelers, and in the case of Prince William, they were therefore treated by a drug called Praziquantel. It is cheap, it is efficacious, you take one single dose of it, and it kills the parasites, 
and in old school universities for Poland. Unlike those fortunate people in this country, that young girl from one of our study sites could not be treated. And the reason for that is that she's five years old. When the clinical trials for Prasopanto were originally conducted in the 1970s, they were conducted in people aged six years and above. And therefore, the drug was registered for use only in people six years and above. Now, this disease is dreadful. This young lady is at advanced stages of liver damage. She would have got infected as a young child. Infections contracted in childhood can have lifelong consequences. This disease and that stage of affairs with the drugs would have never been tolerated in our Western countries. So why on earth did we think this was acceptable for African children? Well, I didn't accept it, and neither did a couple of my friends. So together, with funding from the World Health Organization, we went out and we conducted the studies to generate the missing data. We took that data back to the World Health Organization, who had funded us for those studies, and we presented the evidence that this drug was safe and efficacious in these young children. As a result, in 2012, the World Health Organization revised their guidelines to allow these children to be treated. And that meant over 50 million African children could now receive treatment for the, this disease. That righted a decades-old inequality, an inequality that should have never been there in the first place. Now, I'm hoping the examples that I've given you here indicate why it is very important for a health system to move to a point where it is guided by variation and it is responding to that. So how do we do that? Well, I have a strategy and a proposition. It is a paradigm shift to move what we already know from precision medicine, which currently focuses on looking at the health of an individual based on their molecular or genetic makeup. What I am proposing is that we take that and look at it at population level, and not just look at the molecular differences, but also add the other determinants of our health, things like our environment, our diet, and our behaviors. These things make a difference between populations and within populations. Once we take that into account, we will have a more equitable health system. And this matters to you and I in this room. It matters to Scotland because health inequality is one of our biggest challenges. And it matters globally because without health equality, we are not going to meet our sustainable development goals in health or in equity. So how do we make this paradigm shift from precision medicine to precision public health? Well, I have put together three pillars of what we need to do. First is training. We need to train our health workers to deal with implicit and explicit bias. There should be no place in our health workers' vocabulary for phrases such as man flu. We should ensure our educational resources, such as textbooks, cover symptoms and treatments across all range of people. In this day and age, there should be no dermatological textbooks that do not show photographs of diseases across the skin um, color range. We also ensure that our health workers are skilled to provide interventions and treatments to people of all attributes. In this day and age, there should be no reason why our health workers struggle to find blood vessels in people of different color in order to take blood, something that occurs routinely. Clinical trials, we are all now very familiar with clinical trials thanks to COVID. These should be inclusive and they should be relevant. In this day and age, there is no reason why we should still be extrapolating efficacy and safety data of medicines and interventions in pregnant women from studies conducted in non-pregnant people and in some cases even worse in men. We should not be extrapolating the efficacy and safety data of pediatric medicines from studies done in adults. COVID-19 has clearly shown us that children are not just small adults. They are physiologically different. The last pillar of this is research. Our research should acknowledge difference and it should close data gaps. A recent survey and a study in the US showed that the artificial intelligence algorithms that are used to determine respiratory pathology from radiographs 
consistently miss pathology in people of certain groups, particularly children, people of Hispanic and African-American origin. This is because the algorithms are not trained using data from these people, and it's not because somebody is being mean, it's because the data is not there. So we need to ensure that our research is encompassing all these people. Now, if we take those three pillars together, our training, our clinical trials, and our research, we build a health system where the right treatment is given to the right people at the right time. That is called precision public health. With precision public health, we would all be individuals and we would all be winners. Now, wouldn't that be progress? Thank you.